All right, well, let's begin by reading the passage we're going to look at. It is a shorter passage, but still 15 verses long. Acts chapter 28, um, beginning in verse 1 through verse 15. And again, what we're looking at here is the conclusion of the voyage that uh, Paul took uh, to, to Rome. And um, at, at, um, at certain points, uh, BJ is going to put up the map we were looking at last week, not, not right now, of course, but to um, show us where some of these places are and uh, where Malta is, because that is where um, most of this is going to take place, but then we're going to see the conclusion of that voyage and um, what, what that looks like uh, on the map. So beginning in verse 1, when they had been brought safely through, this is of course the end of the shipwreck and everybody's made it to shore, then we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness, for because of the rain that had set in and because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, Undoubtedly this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. But they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place, there were, um, were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. After this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. They also honored us with many marks of respect, and when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all we needed. At the end of three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship which had wintered uh, at the island and which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. After we put in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. From there, we sailed around and arrived at Regium, and a day later, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Puteoli. There, we found some brethren and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and thus we came to Rome. And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there as far as the market of Appius and three inns to meet us. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Well, again, may the Lord bless his uh, word to our understanding this morning. Now, last week, remember, we were looking at the first leg of Paul's voyage to Rome. We saw the storm that the Lord raised up. Remember, he's the one who's in sovereign control of all things. Having reached Fair Havens, which was on the island of Crete between September and October, the weather was worsening and the harbor was not a suitable place to winter. So they tried to make it to the far west of the island to Phoenix, uh, where it would be a more suitable port. But before they got there, a northeaster drove them out to sea. And with the storm blackening the skies for days, they weren't able to see the sun or the stars and navigate. They didn't know where they were, didn't know which way to go. So things looked hopeless. But remember, into this darkness, the Lord sent light. He dispatched an angel to encourage Paul to tell him that he must stand before Caesar, which meant that he would be brought safely through. And in his mercy, God had also promised to spare the crew. Now Paul believed, he believed the word of the Lord and he was encouraged because he knew that the Lord would do exactly what he said he would do. And we saw finally that Paul was not disappointed. When the sailors took soundings, they found that they were nearing land. When the dawn finally broke, they saw a beach and they tried to drive the ship onto it, but the bow stuck fast on a reef and the waves began to break it apart. So the centurion basically ordered everyone who could swim to make it for shore and those who couldn't to find some kind of flotation device to help them. 
And the Lord allowed them all to make it safely to land, exactly as he promised Paul that he would. Now again, I think it's, it's helpful to be reminded, you know, that um, what we saw last week, that God keeps his word. His promises are true. What God did for them, God will also do for us if we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord has not promised that if we follow him, the things will be easy. As a matter of fact, he's basically promised it will be just the opposite. If we follow him in this world, we will have tribulation. Things will get difficult. Things will get dark. Sometimes they will become seemingly hopeless. But our Lord Jesus Christ also reminds us that he has overcome the world in the darkness. God gives us light. He gives us hope. He gives us his promises. We don't need an angel to come down and tell us because he's already written them down in his word. His word is steadfast and sure. We simply need to believe what the Lord says. And we need to trust him to do what he says. And let's not forget too what J.C. Ryle reminded us of last week. And that is the Lord will often allow things to get very dark. So that when he breaks through with his light, it will be all the more conspicuous. Now, this morning, we come to the end of the voyage. First thing we see is the kindness of the natives on this particular island. Luke says that they didn't know when they came to land, this was a strange island, they didn't know what it was, but they soon discovered the name of the island was called uh, excuse me, Malta. It, it had another name. Melita, which is actually the name of one of our hymns. I know there must be a connection. But the word means a place of refuge. It's an island about 18 miles long and 8 miles wide and located about 60 miles south of Sicily, which, if you don't remember, is an, another island off the southern tip of Italy. Malta was settled by the Phoenicians in 1000 BC. You know, the Phoenicians were basically known for their um, merchandising, they were the merchants of the ancient world known for their ships and their enterprising spirit. They had essentially colonized everywhere in the Roman Empire, which at that time was not the Roman Empire. The, the bay in Malta where the ship was wrecked is today called St. Paul's Bay. And as a matter of fact, it exactly fits the description that Luke gives to us uh, in the book of Acts. Now, Luke calls the inhabitants natives. Uh, in the original language, it's, it's the word from which we get the word barbarian, okay? And I know when we, if you've watched enough of the old movies, you know, uh, barbarian usually means some sort of uncultured, uh, rough characters that uh, are, are basically brutes, but um, that's not what the word means. Barbarian is a word that the Greeks used to refer to the people groups who clung to their original tongue, who didn't learn the common language. And you've probably heard the expression when they're called barbarians because when you listen to them speak, it sounds like they're just sort of babbling on, saying something like barbar, and perhaps that, that is the case. But the thing that stood out to Luke about these particular people was not that they were speaking a foreign language, but their extraordinary kindness that they had showed them essentially hospitality. Because of the cold, because of the storm, because of the rain, because of the fact they had basically all just come out of the ocean swimming and they were soaking wet, they built a fire for them uh, to warm them. They, they received them, which means that they did more than just warm them, but they also tried to take care of their needs. And let's not forget, you know, Luke isn't talking about himself and Paul and Aristarchus. We're talking about the sailors, we're talking about the soldiers, we're talking about 276 men. This is extraordinarily kind for this group of people to take care of their needs. Now, I just wanted to pause for a moment and think about this because this is very striking. Kindness, you know, I mean, what is it that stands out uh, about those that, that you and I care about the most? You know, people that we think of with, with fond memories. You know, isn't it the kindness that, that they've shown to you? You know, I, I still have from my own childhood memories that stand out. You know, I have some memories of bad things that happen. I mean, we remember those things too. But especially acts of extraordinary kindness. And I had two aunts, or 
aunts that, um, that did this, my favorite aunts. You know, it's funny, I didn't have necessarily favorite uncles, but I had favorite aunts because they were the ones that were showing me kindness. And on, on a couple of occasions, several occasions, they would just go out of their way to, to just basically give us what we, what we wanted to make us happy, to make sure that we were having a good time. And I remember those things because, you know, it's not very often that people are, are kind today. Kindness is a memorable thing. It creates good memories. It makes us think warmly of other people. But that, you see, is precisely what the Lord wants us to do towards each other within the body of Christ. I've already mentioned in the book of Ephesians where Paul writes to the Ephesians, be kind to one another, which literally means be, be obliging, be benevolent. You know, benevolent means to, to do good things, to do good to others. He also says, be tenderhearted. Do this out of a heart of affection, out of a heart of compassion. And of course, forgiving each other, not holding grudges, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And essentially, I think what Paul is saying here is that the Lord has showered upon you so much kindness, so much mercy. He wants you to show that same kindness to others. Our Lord Jesus tells us in Luke's gospel in what's considered a parallel account to the Sermon on the Mount that we are to show this kindness even towards our enemies. Of course, we've read about that already in, in Romans chapter 12. But Jesus commands us in Luke 6.35, but love your enemies. And again, he doesn't mean just feel affection towards them. But do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Now, why is it that the majority of mankind seems to think, I mean, first of all, they believe God exists. I mean, I think R.C. told us that even within the Western cultures, only like 10%, maybe even less than that, that are actually atheists. And they are the ones who are denying the fact that, that you know, the evidence that we see all around us of the existence of God. But why is it that the vast majority of the world that believes that God exists believe that, that He loves them? Well, it's because He is kind to ungrateful and evil men. But they mistake that kindness for acceptance, that they're okay and God's going to receive them in the end. But these other things we see in the world, you know, the, the conscience, how we feel the guilt for the things we've done, uh, God's wrath that's being poured out from day to day is how we know that isn't the case. But you see, the point is, God is kind to and grateful to evil men. He, he gives sun, He gives rain, He gives everything that they, they need. I was listening to John Gerster in his apologetics saying that God shows much more goodness and gives much more pleasure than He does pain because he's so benevolent and, and good, but this goodness is meant to lead them to repentance. But again, he does this. And Jesus says to us who are to reflect his image that this is also what we are to do. Again, consider how kind Jesus was to his enemies as he expresses the kindness of God uh, in his life. We are to follow that example. Now, kindness is in short supply today which is why those we show it to will remember and why it should also be a part of our witness. And you know, we also shouldn't miss the fact that those who showed this extraordinary kindness on this occasion were not even believers. They were unbelievers. They were Phoenicians, pagans. The fact that they could do this is what we call common grace. You know, God does give to some people a kind spirit by nature. Sometimes it far outstrips anything that we do as believers. But we do need to remember as well that we have the Spirit of God if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, which means we have an even greater potential to show kindness to others. But it doesn't happen automatically, does it? We have to be diligent in cultivating it. We need to resist the flesh fight the flesh, put it to death, and we need to yield to the Spirit. We need to allow the Spirit of God to move us in the right direction, yield to the affections and the desires that He gives to us as He leads us in the Word of God. That is the direction He will lead us, in the direction of kindness. 
Now, secondly, we see these people misjudge Paul. Paul decided that he would keep the fire going after they had kindled this fire. And just, you know, it reminds us that just because somebody is serving us, you know, they, they built the fire for us, it doesn't mean that we just sit there and let them serve us. We should lend a hand to make their work easier. And I think Paul here was simply returning their kindness by helping them uh, with kindness. And he was also showing kindness to the many others present. You know, it seems like when somebody sets out to serve, people are more than happy to let them serve. But we need to make sure we join in the, the service. But when he picked up this pile of dry twigs and threw them on the fire, uh, there was a poisonous snake that was activated by the heat and came out to get away from it. And being aggravated by the heat, fastened itself on Paul's hand. When the natives saw the viper hanging from his hand, they said to each other in verse 4, Undoubtedly, this man is a murderer, and though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. They, their conclusion was that this man must be guilty of murder because the viper on his hand was deadly. And even though he escaped the sea, and they knew that he had just you know, basically escaped the shipwreck, Justice required that he still die. Now, what they were talking about here is, is essentially the Greek goddess of justice, whose name was basically de decay. Not decay as in something is dissolving, but it's the, the Greek word for, for justice. And the name of this goddess was literally the word for justice. Okay? Lady, or I should say justice, was basically pictured as this goddess or this woman. Now, this is where Lady Justice originates. You know, you've seen perhaps in front of the courthouse the, the, the woman who is standing there with the scales in her hand and the blindfold. Uh, this is Lady Justice. She holds out the scales to weigh the evidence. She's blindfolded that she might do it impartially. Uh, this, this was their conception, you know, that there is such a thing as justice. Now, what's more interesting is how these Greeks or these natives concluded that there must be such a thing as justice, okay? The, um, the sea, the, the sea, if the sea didn't get Paul, this viper certainly must get him, that the scales must ultimately be balanced. And the question is, why did they believe that? Well, they believed it for the same reason that, um, again, we, we saw um, earlier um, as far as uh, kindness, why people think that um, God being a God of love is going to accept everyone because of the revelation of God's kindness in this case, because of the revelation of his justice. In Romans chapter 1, Paul tells us that God regularly shows his disapproval of sin in this world by pouring out his judgment day to day. People can see the connection between the evil things that people do and what happens to them in life. And these people were making that connection. Now, in their ignorance, they were attributing this to an imaginary being. You know, unbelievers don't always understand God's revelation. Again, they misinterpret his kindness, thinking that that's acceptance. They also can misinterpret his justice, thinking that there's some other being out there that's actually doing this. But this bringing justice, making this connection between the evil act and this retribution is one of the many ways that God shows his existence and his displeasure of sin. By the way, as we've already seen in our series on apologetics, this is one of the many things we can point to to prove that God exists. We see his kindness, he's a benevolent being. We know from conscience when we do what is good, conscience makes us feel good. We know that God approves of good. But we also know we do things that, that we know are wrong and when that happens, we don't feel good. And we also see consequences of that. It shows us that God does not approve of sin and that he is going to bring judgment. Well, again, they drew this connection. Paul must be a murderer. But that was their first misjudgment. That was their first mistake. Now their second was just the opposite. They swung all the way to the other end. While they were watching, Paul, you know, watching, Paul shook the snake off into the fire 
He didn't just, you know, fling it off somewhere for somebody else to get bit, but he disposed of it where it wouldn't threaten anyone else. And as they watched him, they expected that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead because they knew what vipers of this particular kind could do. But after so much time passed and nothing happened, they concluded instead he must be a god. Okay, again, another mistake. Now they were wrong. On the one hand, they were wrong. Paul was merely a man like them. But on the other hand, they weren't entirely wrong, were they? Only God could do something like this. You see, in that they were right. Remember how the Lord authenticates his messengers? By giving them the power to do what only he could do. Sometimes people who saw the, the apostles do miracles, uh, certainly among the Gentiles, thought that those who were doing these miracles were gods. Remember what happened uh, at Lystra and Iconium, where they came out and started to worship them. Well, Paul and, of course, the apostles would always reject that worship. But the Lord Jesus didn't because he is God. He received that worship. But they would make this mistake because of this divine intervention. But again, the purpose of this miracle was to point out that this person was a messenger from God. He pointed it out by giving them the power to do what only he could do. And these people were amazed at what Paul was able to do. Now, Luke doesn't tell us that Paul shared the gospel with them. But I, I think, you know, it's most likely that that's what he did because God never does miracles in a vacuum, does he? He doesn't just do miracles to benefit people and then walk away. The Lord always did these amazing things to amaze people, to arrest their attention. And now Paul had their attention. And again, I just want to re, you know, remind us that if we want to show someone that the Bible is the Word of God, we need to point to miracles, the miracles that are recorded in the Bible. We first need to present the Bible to them as basically eyewitness testimonies of what it is that others saw Jesus do and what they heard Him say. And from these many eyewitness testimonies, we need to draw the conclusion that Jesus is a messenger sent from God. And as God's messenger, he declares the Bible to be God's word. Okay, again, I'm going to repeat this argument many times because I, I do want us to remember that this is how we draw the line from the God we see in the creation to the God who has revealed himself in the word of God. And let's not forget that Jesus, who was authenticated by these miracles, not only said that the scripture is the word of God, but he also declared himself to be the Son of God and the only Savior of the world. We must believe what he said because God has authenticated him. Now, we can't do miracles today to authenticate the word. We don't need to do miracles today. We just simply need to point to those which the Lord has done. Same thing that John Calvin did when the Roman church, remember, said to him, these are our miracles that prove that our doctrine is true. Where are your miracles? John Calvin said they're in the Bible. Those have been authenticated. That truth has been authenticated by God. That is the truth we hold to. Now third, and fourth briefly, but third, we see Paul's ministry on the island. Luke tells us there was a man there by the name of Publius. Uh, one commentator writes this, Octavius Augustus, that is Caesar Augustus installed a Roman governor on Malta. In inscriptions, his office is the chief man over all the municipality of Malta. This fits Luke's description of Publius as the chief man of the island. So basically, he's the governor, he's the Roman official. Well, he also opens up his house and he welcomes and he entertains them for three days. You know, if you um, ever want to go to a place in the world that's welcoming, sounds like Malta, it'd be a great place to go. Everybody there is so friendly. So anyway, he, he's, he's showing them this kindness. Now, while they were there, Paul learned that Publius's father was in bed with a recurring fever and dysentery. Dysentery is essentially Montezuma's revenge, okay? A very sincere, excuse me, severe intestinal condition. One, one commentator writes this, the Greek word suggests repeated feverish attacks. 
The ailment has been diagnosed in modern times as Malta fever, okay, caused by the milk of Maltese goats. If you ever visit Malta, <laughs> stay away from the goat's milk, okay? All right. So Paul went in to see him. He prayed, he laid his hands on him, and he healed him. And again, there's no mention of his sharing the gospel, but it's hard to imagine him not doing this, not only in the light of this miraculous healing, but in the light of what Paul does everywhere he goes. He shares the gospel. That's the reason he's doing whatever he's doing, is to get that word out. Now, word soon got around, and the rest of the island came to him with their diseases, and all who came were healed. And again, what did Paul do? Well, I think we should assume he shared the gospel. Again, Paul, that's what he was all about, putting the kingdom of heaven first. This is what we need to do, put the kingdom of God first. That's why God saved us. That's why we're here, that we might do the same. Now, finally, we see God's promise and Paul's desire fulfilled. After they had spent three months on the island, here's where we get to the rest of the journey, okay? Uh, they boarded an Alexandrian ship that had wintered there, okay? Let's not forget the last ship they were on was an Alexandrian ship. And it's not that they made poor ships, but just there was a lot of them in the water. They were doing commerce from Alexandria, Egypt, and they were transporting grain as they went through the various ports of the Mediterranean and made their way to Italy. Now, the weather was still a bit uncertain, but it was safer than earlier, and so they boarded the ship. Luke notes that this particular ship had the twin brothers for their figurehead, okay? These are the heavenly twins, uh, the supposed twin sons of Zeus, Castor and Pollux. Uh, these were the patron deities of seafarers, thinking that by uh, either having these carved images or perhaps painted images on the front of the ship, it would please the gods and they would make it to their desired destination. Again, showing the prevalence of idolatry in, in the days of, uh, of Paul. If you remember, as he was returning from his third missionary voyage and we were looking at all the different places they stopped, Paul saw the remnants of idolatry everywhere that he went, and it reminded him of how the kingdom of God, as it was growing, was essentially going to put an end to all this idolatry. Perhaps he thought of the same thing when he saw this. Now, because of what the Lord had done for them through Paul's ministry, the islanders made sure that they had everything they needed for the voyage, again, showing kindness and thankfulness for these mercies. So after setting sail, they put in at Syracuse, which is on the eastern coast of Sicily, and they stayed there for three days. From there, they set sail and arrived at Regium, which is on the southern tip of Italy, and two days later, they came to Puteoli. This, this is essentially, you know, Rome is inland, but Puteoli is the main port of Rome. Uh, 182 miles north of Regium, eight miles uh, northwest of Neapolis or Naples. There they found some believers, and the believers invited them to stay with them for seven days. And again, we have example after example of hospitality. Just, it's a wonderful thing. And then finally, they completed the trip by land, some 117 miles. Doesn't seem like a very practical port, but perhaps it's only the only practical port that Rome had. Maybe most of their travels were by land, I don't know. But they finally arrived at Rome. Luke tells us that some of the brethren from the market of Appius, which was 90 miles from Puteoli and 40 miles from Rome, on the Appian Way, one commentator says, you know, that where Paul basically walked from Puteoli to Rome on the Appian Way, that that road still exists and said, if you want to walk where Paul walked, you can literally do that on the Appian Way. And some of them came from three inns, which is about 30 miles away from Rome. Uh, when they heard about Paul and he had, that he had arrived there, they, they came to meet him. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and was encouraged. Now, he was encouraged not only because the Lord had fulfilled his promise and he had made it safely to Rome, but he was encouraged because God had answered his prayers. I don't know how many times I've read this passage and didn't really think about this. But this was the answer to Paul's uh, prayer that he had basically said he was praying when he wrote to the Romans. Uh, earlier on, I believe it was around 56. I think right now we're about 61 A.D. 
but he had written in 56 in Romans 1, verses 11 and 12. For I long to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. It was Paul's desire one day to come to Rome in order to encourage the believers there. Well, that, he's in Rome now, and the believers are coming to him, and he is encouraging them and being encouraged by them. So what he had prayed, now the Lord had fulfilled. And let me just close by, by saying this, that when our hearts are filled with the desire to serve the Lord, as Paul's was, he will give us what we most desire. When we pray, He will fulfill the desires of our heart. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. I know oftentimes you read this passage and say, if we pray, God will give us what we want. But that's not what this passage said. It says first we need to delight ourselves in the Lord. He must be first. He must be what we delight in, in serving Him and loving Him and honoring Him. Then if we do... The things we want, the things we ask for in prayer will be the things He wants. And of course, He'll give them to us. As Jesus says, whenever we ask according to His will, He hears us. And we know that we have asked. We know we have what we've asked because we have asked according to His will. Well, may the Lord give to us again that kind of heart He has by His Holy Spirit. But again, we need to cultivate it, don't we? Uh, by putting off, fighting against the flesh, putting it off, and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, whose heart, above all, was to honor His Father. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord uh, to work this work, continue this work in our hearts, and particularly as we would come to the table this morning.